and, and this event, this experience they have with Jesus is directly related to that time marker. And in all three cases, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they tell the story, it comes directly after this event that we studied last week. When Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi and he said, what do the people say about me? Who do the people say that I am? And then the disciples answered with the answer of the crowd. It's the same answer today. Jesus is one among many. You're, he's one of the prophets. May, he might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. It could be that he's Jeremiah. He might be one of the prophets. He is a prophet. He's something. He's one among many. And then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? What is your opinion about me? This is what the people say, one among many, but what do you say? And Peter spoke, he blurted it out, as he often does. And this time it wasn't uh, something stupid. It was God speaking, you know, God had given him revelation. And he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Essentially, Jesus, you're not one among many, you're the one. You're not one of the prophets, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah, you're the one. And, and what an amazing statement. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And Jesus promised that he would build his church upon that rock, that confession. Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus, the foundation of the church. And then right after that, Peter took Jesus, as Jesus began to explain now the nature of his kingdom, he began to explain how he would be crucified. Peter took Jesus aside and said, no. I don't think you have this part right. You know, I just had a revelation from heaven. I think I've had another one. You're not going to go to the cross. Far be it from you, Lord. And remember, Jesus had to rebuke him strongly, sternly. Get behind me, Satan, he said, in front of everybody. You are not mindful of the things of God, but you're mindful of the things of men. See, Peter had a problem related to the kingdom of God. There was some understanding that he had, and then there was massive misunderstanding. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, but the nature of your kingdom, he was completely confused. You're the Christ, the son of the living God, and there's no cross. There's not going to be a cross. Peter couldn't have been more wrong. He couldn't have had it more upside down. And so then Jesus began to explain to them the nature of discipleship, that if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life, that's when you find it. That, um, man, what would he be profited if he gained the whole world but then lost his soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? And then he ends the chapter. If you look at the last verse of chapter 16, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And now after six days, you see the connection? All three accounts of the, the great confession of Peter, the teaching on discipleship, they all end with this, this promise. Some who are standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God coming in power. Now, six days later, Jesus took the connection of these two events. Peter's got an understanding of who Jesus is, but a radical misunderstanding about the nature of his kingdom. Some of them are going to see the kingdom. There are some that I've got to give special class. Now, sometimes when you were in grammar school, maybe some of you guys went to special class. And sometimes special class means that you're advanced and you're ahead of the other kids, and so they want you to be able to go forward. And sometimes special class means you're behind the other kids and you need extra help. And your mom probably lied to you, told you that your kind was the kind where you're advanced. And um, I don't know if Peter's mom knew that his her son was a special disciple. But Peter and James and John are special, and they are going to an extra class with Jesus. And there's a reason for it. They have a, an important role to play in the work of Jesus in the world, and they are grossly mistaken about his kingdom. They're grossly mistaken about it, especially as it relates to death. <clears throat> as it would relate to how the work of God is going to unfold as it would relate to the, the role of resurrection and the role of crucifixion. That with, with God, there's life, but preceding that resurrected life, in order to have a resurrection, you have to, by definition, have death. You can't have resurrection unless something dies. And, and in the world, the world's so corrupt, the world's so upside down, Jesus 
has chosen a means by which of redeeming the world. The, the way in which he works is totally opposite of the way the world thinks. And there, the work of Jesus involves sacrifice. It will involve death. It will involve what looks like failure. It will involve um, amazing brokenness. If you're going to be involved in what Jesus is doing, you're going to have to have a complete transformation in the way that you think. Because not the way the world is. The world's the exact opposite of God. The things that the world loves, God hates. The things that God loves, the world hates. And so Peter, James, and John have a great role to play in the establishing of the church. Peter is going to be the one who opens the door in the preaching of the gospel, and 3,000 people will get saved the very first time he preaches. Not bad for a first sermon, I would say. 3,000 people come, and they respond to the message. They're baptized. The church begins. Within just a short time, it's several thousand people, and these guys are ministering to the people. John would be the disciple, the apostle that lives the longest of the 12. He'll be alive at the end of the first century. He'll write the gospel of John when he's an elderly man. He'll write the, the, the book of Revelation as a very old man in exile on an on a island in the Mediterranean. He will have outlived all of his friends. He will have heard the reports. Someone bring in a message. Did you hear the news? What happened? Well, Paul, no, don't tell me. I don't, no, don't tell me. They cut his head off. His brother, James, would be the first one to die of the 12. Herod would take him and have him put to death with the sword. These, these three men of all the 12 have an interesting relationship with Jesus, and they're pulled aside by Jesus on three different occasions by themselves to have extra class, an, a special class for them. And all three times, there's a similarity. The first time they're pulled aside separately is when the ruler of the synagogue comes to Jesus, kind of in the height of his popularity. That's when the crowds are thronging Jesus and they can't eat. There's the, every, they wake up in the morning, the courtyard's full of people. They're ministering to people all day long. They, you know, they, they're just so busy. And during that time, the ruler of the synagogue had a 12-year-old daughter. She became gravely ill. He decided to, you know, forego custom. He came to Jesus and said, please come to my house. I'm in desperate need. My daughter's sick. She's going to die. And then they're traveling on the way there. Remember, that's where the woman who had the issue of blood and thought if she could just touch his garment, she would be healed. And she pushes right through the crowd, touches Jesus. As soon as she touches his clothes, she's healed. She thinks she snuck in. She's going to sneak out. And Jesus stops, stops everything. Jairus, the synagogue ruler, is in a big hurry. His daughter's so sick. Jesus says, wait a minute, something happened. Someone touched me. The apostles look at Jesus and say, who didn't touch you? Everybody's touching you. You know, you're like the Beatles. You know, you're, you can make a newsreel about you. You know, you, you know, we're trying to get you through the crowd. We can't even move. And he goes, no, someone touched me. And there's the woman, and she falls at his feet. She tells him everything. And he says, daughter, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And then the, the synagogue ruler, come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. We've got to get to my house. And when they get there, it's too late. The mourners are mourning. People are wailing. There's the girl's dead. They're, the mom is crying like a mom would cry when you've lost a 12-year-old daughter. She's heartbroken. Jesus didn't get there in time. And the mourners are mourning. Jesus says, wait a minute, stop. The little girl's not dead. She's only sleeping. And the mourners change from mourners to mockers, and they start mocking Jesus. And Jesus chases them out, and he took Peter and James and John inside the house. He didn't take the other disciples in the house, not the apostles, the others. They didn't come in. It was just Peter and James and John. And they go inside the house, and there's the little girl. She's dead. And Jesus, in very simple very gentle language says little girl I say to you arise there was no shouting there was no majestic hair with hairspray and a nice white suit and a group of you know people around him there was no fundraising at the end there was no uh, recording of it on video so that you could show everybody so you could get more money Jesus isn't a televangelist there was no fanfare. There wasn't even a crowd. And when he was done, he said, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anyone. Give the girl something to eat. She must be hungry. She died. 
you know, dying takes a lot out of you. You know, you got to eat if you get raised from the dead. So give her something to eat. Don't tell anyone. But Peter and James and John were there for that. Jesus wanted them to see something. His resurrection power. That there wouldn't be any shouting. There wouldn't be any groaning. There wouldn't be any, you know, it would just be little girl. Honey, sweetie pie. Get up. And up she would come back to life. And they witnessed that. The second time Jesus separated them was in the passage that we're in. Jesus tells the nine, you guys wait here. I'm going to take Peter and James and John, and we're going to go up into this mountain, and we're going to pray. They went up into the mountain to pray. We know that because the other accounts say that they were sleepy while this was happening. They, they, they were praying, and the transfiguration starts to happen, and they really weren't you know, praying so intently. They were more like, you know, looking at the inside of their eyelids. And uh, they were sleepy. And it was as they came out of that sleep, they saw the transfiguration happening. So it was on this occasion, and uh, we'll talk more about why that is on our passage and a little later in our message. But you'll notice when we read that Moses and Elijah were there with him in the transfiguration. Not only was Jesus tran transfigured, but Moses and Elijah were there. And we'll... We'll look at this in detail uh, in a few minutes, but they were speaking about Jesus' coming death. So they'd been in the house where Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now they're on the mountain where he's transfigured in all of his glory. But in all of his glory, what is he talking about? He's talking about his coming death. And then the last time the three of them were separated with Jesus was the worst time of their life. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the night before Jesus was crucified. They were all there in the garden, and Jesus told all the guys that his soul was sorrowful, exceeding sorrowful, even unto the point of death. He told them all to pray, and then he took Peter and James and John, and he separated himself from the others, and he began to pray with them. And then he even separated himself a bit from them and began to pray by himself. That's when Peter and the guys fell asleep. But Peter and James and John separated in the garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus is now entering into death himself. So it's very interesting these three guys separated at certain times. I don't know that you'd want to, finding this out, that you'd want to ever be separated from the other disciples. <laughs> if Jesus ever came and said, hey, I need to separate you. Come with me. Like, no, no, can we bring everybody? <laughs> He's separating them to give them insight into what? Well, we might say in the grander scheme of things, we'd say, well, the nature of his kingdom Yes, but what does that mean specifically? What is it that they're not understanding? They're very interested in glory. Peter's very interested in you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and what he thinks that means, the glory. But when Jesus said, here's what it means. Here's the state of the world, and here's the way I'm going to overcome the world, and here is my plan, Peter's not interested at all in that. There's going to be a resurrection, but there's also going to be a crucifixion. There's going to be glory, but there's also going to be suffering. The plan of God's going to be worked out in all of our lives through great suffering. The, the work of God in our life today. Paul said it about his own ministry. He said, I make up in my body that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now, Paul has good theology. He wrote the book of Romans. He understands there's nothing lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Jesus said it is finished. When Jesus died on the cross, everything was necessary for salvation was finished. But in order for the work of Jesus to continue, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to bear in their body the continual sufferings of Christ. There's a lot of sacrificing that still will have to go on. There's a lot more people who are going to die for Jesus before he comes back and takes the church. There are people who are going to sacrifice reputation. There are people who are going to sacrifice a livelihood. There are people who are going to lose everything because of Jesus. There's people who are going to lose relationships. They're going to lose jobs. They're going to lose a standing in society. And they'll willingly give it up for Jesus. There's going to be a lot of sacrificing that still goes on. Paul said, I'm burying in my body which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection, he would write. But he'd say also the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know his power the power of his life, but I also want to share in his sacrifice. That's the nature of his kingdom, and that's what they weren't understanding. And so they had these times alone with Jesus, 
Peter, James, and John separated to see his power over death, to see him just speak very simply, little girl, arise and raise the dead, to see him here transfigured in all of his glory, radiating glory, and yet speaking of his coming death, and then see him in the garden sweating as it were great drops of blood, his soul exceedingly sorrowful unto death. The face that was radiating like the sun shining in its strength is now weighed down with the, the cross, the coming cross, the shame of the cross. So it's very interesting, uh, these three pulled aside for these three events. Now, this particular event is, is mysterious to us because of, of the glory aspect. It says he was transfigured before them. No one knows what that means. The only thing we know about it is what's written. You don't have any idea what a transfiguration is. You might have seen somebody win Miss America, or you might have seen somebody win the NBA title, or you might see someone on the podium where they're playing a national anthem and they've been given a gold medal and they're standing on a podium. But that's not glory like this. When it says he's transfigured, it means that earth is now going to experience heaven. There's a transformation that happens. You can't say, you, you, you can't, you, we can't understand it. What does it mean to be transfigured? What is he transfigured into? What will it be like? Well, they give us something of what it's like. They say he was transfigured before them. It says his face shone like the sun. Okay, that makes sense. I've seen that before. You know, like when, oh, wait, I've never seen this before. What is the sun like when it's shining in its strength? Can you look at the sun when it's shining in its strength? What happens to your eyes if you look at the sun? Your eyes will get burnt. Even if you just barely look at the sun and look away, what happens when you close your eyes? What do you see? Little black discs floating around, you know, as you've started already the process of burning your eyeball. If you stare at it for a long time, We'll know next week at church when you walk in blind. You'll blind yourself. His, he's transfigured, and they, they can't look at him, essentially. It's one way you can think of it. His face is shining like the sun. There's, a, there's radiant glory coming out of him, causing his face to be like sunlight. And then his clothes, he's wearing clothes. They're earthly clothes. He's got that, that robe that had been woven top to bottom and without seam. And yet his clothes became white as the light. Something is happening with Jesus where, where his, his glory is radiating out of him. Now, I was reading uh, in the, a great book called The Crises of the Christ by G. Campbell Morgan. His, his uh, teaching on this particular chapter in that book is very interesting. But one of the things he, he suggested or, or, or wondered about, he said, we don't know how many times this happened before this. It could have happened. You know, Jesus was many times praying by himself. This, it just so happens that on this time, the disciples were there and they saw it. Jesus brought them out there so that they could observe this. But we don't know that every time he was praying, who he really was was radiating. Now, most of the time, who he really was in the sense of his deity, of his glory, it was concealed so that people could mock him. You know, they would spit on him. I don't think that if his face is shining like the sun that you spit on someone like that. Or rip their beard. Or put a crown of thorns on their head and beat it in with a reed. Or bow down before him and say, oh, hail, king of the Jews. Oh, oh, you're something. I think if your clothes are radiating like light and your face is shining like the sun, I don't think they hang you from a cross. I don't think so. But he, he had emptied himself. He'd humbled himself. But it didn't change who he really was. And on this day, Jesus is magnificent in all of his glory. Now, it is possible, we've seen it in the scripture, for us to reflect his glory. We've seen human beings that were radiant. Moses, I think, is the best example. Moses on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, being in the presence of God. When he came down, the people were freaked out because Moses' face was shining. He was radiating. And so they put a veil over his face because it was... It was too trippy for everybody. They couldn't handle it. And the glory would f was fading away. But Moses was radiant. But that was not Moses' glory. That was Moses reflecting God's glory. Moses, having been in the presence of God, had the glory of God affect him in a way. And it was, he was reflecting that. But it wasn't his. Much the same way as the moon can be very brilliant, very 
bright, but it doesn't have its own glory. It's reflecting the sun's glory. Now, the sun has its own glory. It's, 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 a, it's an energy machine that's just radiating. Now, we're reflecting the sun's light when we're outside. You know, that, that's the sunlight bouncing off of you that comes off. It's, but you're not radiating. You know, if we turn off all the lights, you're not going to glow. Even those of you that were baptized, when we used to baptize over at Rancho Seco. Well, at least we hope you don't glow. You know, we haven't done a test for all together. You know, you're not going to, you don't glow. You, you can reflect light, but you don't radiate. What's going on with Jesus? He's radiating. This isn't Jesus reflecting God's glory. This is Jesus glorious. This is who he is. This is Jesus giving these three disciples some awareness of his glory. He's radiant with his own glory. Our passage says that he's shining like the sun. In Luke, when he tells the story, he says Jesus is white and the appearance, his appearance is like lightning. A little different than what Matthew describes it. It's like lightning. It's like <laughs> there's this radiant power coming out of, of this bright white light. And then Mark puts it a little differently. Mark says, that he's radiating white and it's like snow. Snow is interesting in that it, the way that snow reflects the light. So you ha- it's, it's glistening. It's, 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 it's not just one lightning, it's a million lightnings. And so what was it to see Jesus? How would you explain it? So they've told the story and these guys are retelling it. And Mark said, yeah, here's what, I re- here's what, they, here's what Peter told me. It was, it was this amazing radiant glory but like the snow, like a million lightnings happening. Yeah, I had talked to James, and James said that it was like lightning. You know, bam, it was so powerful. No, I heard, I heard from John, it was like the sun, that you'd look, and then you couldn't look. How do you describe it? Well, who is, who is this person? Now, they've eaten with him. They've, they've taken food with him. They've watched him sit down because he was tired. They've seen him asleep. They've... They've walked along on a dusty road with him. They've, they've watched him be misunderstood. They've seen him with his mom and his brothers and his sisters. But who is he? Now, the place of the transfiguration in the life of Jesus is also very interesting and also mysterious. As this happens, of course, we have Peter speaking up and... Uh, it's in one of the other places, Mark or Luke, I can't remember right now. Um, one of the other, they're both chapter 9, so if you wanted to look it up later, Mark 9 or Luke 9. Um, one of the other places says, he said this not knowing what to say. On behalf of Peter, could I just encourage you to learn from him that if you don't know what to say, better just not say anything, you know? I think <laughs> Peter, you know, I think when we get to heaven, he's going to go, look at I made all those mistakes so you wouldn't have to. He speaks up, and there's nothing wrong with the first thing he says. He says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Well, of course it's good for us. You know, Jesus brought them there. Lord, it's good for us to be here, period, end of things that Peter has to say. That would have been a good place to stop. Instead, Peter said, you know, if you like, we can make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. You know, we could camp out up here. We could make them tents for these guys. Now, while he's saying that, God doesn't let him continue. Who knows what else he might have said. While he was still speaking in verse 5, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. You see, the place of the transfiguration in the life of Jesus, God said it. God, God interrupted. Peter, this isn't a moment for you to give commentary or suggestions. We don't need suggestion guy, Peter. This is worship time. It's time to just receive. God has something he's trying to say. Jesus isn't transfigured before you ever before or again. The man of sorrows acquainted with grief is the one that you know. The one with the weight of the world on his shoulders. The one who set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. That's the one that you're going to see. God's opened a window so that you could see heaven, so you could see the glory of God. God's now going to speak to you. And what did God say? God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do those words sound familiar? God doesn't speak audibly very often in the Bible. 
But in the ministry of Jesus, there's three times God spoke audibly. Two of the times he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That should be significant. On his baptism is when God said those words. When Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. The spirit of God descended like a dove and remained upon him. And God spoke audibly. People could hear it and and recognize it. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So that's God's statement on the life of Jesus up to that point. My son lived a normal childhood. He learned a trade. He worked with his hands. He lived in obscurity like all, most all of us will live. He's also going to live as a celebrity, which very few live. But he will, he will live a life of obscurity, a normal human life, who he will have been subjected to his mom and his stepdad. He'll be raised with brothers and sisters. He'll have cousins. He'll be raised in a community. He'll be called the carpenter. He'll be a man who's earned a living with his own hands and provided for his family. And he will have done that. And at 30 years, God will look at his life and say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus has done everything that I could ever have wanted him to do. Now, God could not say that about Adam and Eve. And he can't say it about me. And he can't say that about you. Now, he, he can say that about us through Jesus. But Jesus is the only one that at 30 years old, God would look at his life and say, you know what? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. There's no sin in Jesus. He's never lied. He never cheated. He never padded the books. He never charged somebody, you know, an unfair amount. He never said, hey, this, these supplies cost this much when they really didn't so that he could make a little more money off somebody. He told him he would do it. He would do it. He was, he was without sin. And so at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that began his ministry. And now he's coming to the end of his ministry. The Mount of Transfiguration marks another expression of God about the life of Jesus. And this time, in the baptism, the Spirit bodily descending so that everyone would see his unity with the Father and with the Spirit, the three in one, the Trinity, the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, unique and yet one. Now his glory radiates who he really is. He's lived the 30 years of obscurity and now he's lived the three years of celebrity, of doing his ministry, of cleansing a temple at the beginning of his ministry, of making a stand against unrighteousness, of telling the truth in love, of calling disciples, of reaching out to the poor, to the needy, to the lame, to the weak, to the demon possessed, beginning this life of amazing sacrifice of pouring himself out to people. And God's commentary on it is, look, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's God's stamp of approval on his life now up to this point. Jesus, 30 years, living a regular life like any of us would live. And then Jesus living this amazing life like none of us would ever live. And God's stamp of approval is to say he could enter heaven right now. It's his home. He could pass from this life, having lived a perfect human life, and be glorified with the glory that he's always had. I accept his life. If he wanted to, if he had come for a different reason, Jesus could have ascended that moment on the Mount of Transfiguration in his glorified state directly into heaven without passing through death, accepted by God. But he didn't come to save his life but he came to give his life a ransom for many. Transfiguration is a very, very interesting event in the life of Jesus. If Jesus hadn't come to save us, he would have been accepted at that moment directly into heaven, except he came to save us. And Peter, James, and John got a look at it. They got to watch it. They got to see Moses and Elijah standing there talking with them. Now that begs a question. How did Peter and James and John know it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have Moses badge on? Did he have a Moses name tag, you know? Did he have a lanyard? The little picture of Moses, Charlton Heston, you know? Well, he looked just like Charlton Heston. It had to be Moses. And the other guy was eating locusts, you know, or he was all hairy. So maybe, who, how did he know? It's very interesting. They knew. 
It's Moses and Elijah. Maybe Jesus said, hey, Mo. Hey, Eli, what's up? I don't know how they knew, but they knew. Glorified men. If Jesus ascends into heaven, are these men saved? How does Moses, how is Moses even there communicating? Moses is dead. <laughs> how, Elijah was caught up into heaven in a chariot of fire. The, the fact that he's not consumed in that chariot of fire for his sins is only because Jesus will come one day and die on the cross for our sins. If Jesus ascends into heaven in that glorified state and every person who died in faith hoping for a savior, they're all lost. He would have emptied heaven out, essentially. But make no mistake, he could have entered into heaven glorified, unlike any other person. Now, this is real glory. For someone to be able to have lived their life and then to radiate from within them their own glory so that it's like the, sh the sun shining in its strength like snow, like lightning, and to be accepted by God, now that's glory. That's not like any glory that you could ever imagine on this earth. Not even close, doesn't even compare the place of the transfiguration in the life of Jesus, it's before the cross. It's God's stamp of approval. From this point forward, Jesus sets his face steadfastly. He's on his way to Jerusalem. This is God's, God, at the baptism, your life up to that point, accepted. At the transfiguration, your ministry, accepted. And now Jesus is going to Jerusalem to present his life as an offering for sin, having been accepted by God. He had the glory. He had the, he had the acceptance of his father. He had heaven. And he laid it all down on the cross to die for our sins. The place of the transfiguration in the life of Jesus. Very, very interesting thing to consider. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time talking about the place of the transfiguration in the lives of the disciples. So we'll get back to the fact that it's Peter, James, and John these three guys that were separated on three occasions. The first time, Jesus quietly and so simply overcomes death for this little girl. There's no transfiguration. There's no glory. There's no sun shining in its strength. It's just Jesus, the one that they know. And there's a corpse of this little girl, beautiful little girl, the pride and joy of her mom and dad, the weeping, the mom and dad standing there in utter despair, and Jesus saying, little girl, get up. And the little girl comes to life. The humility of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus. You know, Jesus could have transfigured in that house and his face could have been like the sun shining in its strength and he could have been radiating like the snow and like lightning. But he's Jesus. There's glory and there's humility. He's not like anybody you ever have known, and his kingdom is not like any kingdom that you've ever heard of. There's this occasion where he's transfigured. He's not only humble and simple, but he's all, he also can radiate all of his glory. And he speaks of, with Moses and Elijah, about what's coming, and then the Garden of Gethsemane where now his soul is sorrowful even unto the point of death. Peter and James and John will hear him say the words, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. As Jesus looking at the weight of the sin of the world, remember the penalty of sin is death. It's not the crucifixion physically that is weighing on Jesus. It's the reality of what is going to happen on the cross, not physically but spiritually, that he'll bear the sin of the world and he'll taste death for us. And what that means, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't tell you. I just know that he does it. I know that he bears in his body our sins. I know that God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I know the penalty for sin is death, and I know Jesus was made to be sin, and I know he bore that penalty. But how the Son of God can die and pay a spiritual death, I don't understand that. Is there a separation between Father and Son? Could you say that such a thing could happen in the nature of who God is? I don't, I don't understand it. I know something happened. And it resulted in an atonement for sin. The price was paid. And it was paid in full. And the cup that needed to be drunk was completely drained by Jesus. The last drop. He battled with death. And he overcame it in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter and James and John were in that place with him. All three of those places. 
see him overcome death in the case of the little girl, seeing his glory and speaking of his death on the Mount of Transfiguration and then watching him pray and battle with death personally in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they saw it, and that was important for them. It was important for them because of what God needed to do in their life. And the context here, to understand its place in their life, we have to go back to the idea that after six days, Jesus took these guys. Because it was just six days earlier, eight days if you count the two days on either end, that Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, I must die. And Peter said, there's not going to be any dying. <laughs> no dying. We're only living. I want life. I don't want death. Peter is shrinking back from death. Now, James and John, on the other hand, remember they came to Jesus because they had the same interest in his kingdom. They had the same desire for it. It's just as strongly as Peter did. And they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, we thought about it. And we think that my brother and I, we should be on your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. You want us by your side. Riding shotgun. Remember, these guys are called the sons of thunder. Literally, they want to ride shotgun. I mean, they want to be at the right and the left. You be the king, and we'll crack heads. He, I mean, Sons of Thunder, that's a cool nickname. <laughs> if Jesus calls you that, they have a reputation. What's the reputation? Well, they're the ones that when they saw the village of Samaritans that reject, they wouldn't let him pass through. And they came to Jesus and said, you want us to burn them up? You know, right hand and left hand, we could be right here. You know, when, you're, when your kingdom comes in, we can smoke any city. That gives you grief. Jesus' answer when they say, can we sit at your right hand and left hand? Remember his answer? He said, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And remember what they answered? They said, you bet we can. We're able. Peter would hear about death and he would shrink back. James and John will go, bring it on, man. Bring it on. There's no real difference in the misunderstanding of both. They're both wrong. Peter would see it and shrink back. James and John would blindly go forward. That's not courage. That's stupidity. That's foolishness. Because they all would flee and run away from Jesus. They're not going to be at his right hand and his left hand. That's going to be the two thieves on the cross that are on the right hand and the left hand when he comes into his kingdom. They would boldly but blindly face it. They're both wrong. And they need to gain an understanding of Jesus and his kingdom, that his kingdom involves death and resurrection. His kingdom involves suffering and glory. And this will be very important for them because James will be the first one of them, of the 12, to suffer and die. All of the apostles will die, not of old age, but they'll die by being killed for preaching about Jesus. Their relationship with Jesus will directly result in their physical death. Their faithfulness to what Jesus tells them to do will directly result in their physical death. Can you imagine if we had a ministry like that here at the church? We said, you know, we got a ministry opportunity for you. It's going to kill you. You'll die. No, no, not, not by, you know, not, you know, not as a byproduct, but you take on this Sunday school class, they'll kill you. No, literally, you're going to die. They'll all die. Thomas, doubting Thomas, he'll die. Matthew, the tax collector, he's going to die. Peter is going to die. John is going to be killed. James is the first one. Herod takes him and kills him with the sword. They needed to understand Jesus and his kingdom. Peter and John both would write about this event later in their lives. John would write about it in John chapter 1 in that most majestic prologue of the gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing has come into being. In him is life, and the life is the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't grab hold of it. And then a few verses down, he'll say, 
and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. John would say, I stood there on that day when the only begotten of the father was accepted by his father. I saw the glorified man and I heard his acceptance by his father and I know what he did anyways. He could have left us. He could have gone right back into his glory. He was glorious. His father was pleased. He could have left us. But I was not only with him on that mountain, but I was also with him in the garden of Gethsemane. I saw the same man embrace death. I saw him in all of his glory, and I saw him lay down his life. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and then he adds, full of grace and truth. Jesus, so full of grace and truth. See, John would need to come to understand the nature of Jesus' kingdom. His kingdom wasn't going to be like any other kingdom. James and John understood, we want the glory. We want to sit at your right hand and your left hand, and we'll kill anybody that gets in our way, Lord. Hey, we're, we'll do it. Just give us the power. We'll do it. Jesus, I didn't, I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And what about Peter? Turn to 2 Peter, if you will. I want you to read these verses. Very interesting. 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 16, he said, We did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter writing decades later, Encouraging the believers who never had this vision about the, the solid foundation upon which their faith is built. And he said, look at we didn't make this stuff up. This is what we saw. But then he adds, we have the prophetic word confirmed. Verse 19, the more sure word of prophecy, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Look, you don't have to have the man of transfiguration. We had it. But I'm telling you, we saw it, but you have the word of God. You have the word of prophecy, and you should hold on to that, that word of prophecy like a light shining in a dark place. That your, founda your foundation is a rock. We didn't make this stuff up. We were there on the mount. We heard the voice of God. We saw Jesus in his glory. Now, remember that I told you that um, it's in Luke 9, 30 and 31. Luke's account of the transfiguration. Behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, and they spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. In all of his glory, Peter and James and John heard Jesus having a conversation with Moses and Elijah about the cross. Can you imagine that? I wish that was written down. You want to talk about a book on the cross? Well, we have three contributing uh, writers in our uh, compilation. I'll be, I'll be the general editor. Jesus writes a chapter, Moses. And, I mean, what kind of a conversation is that? Jesus glorified, glorified Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about the cross. Now, Luke uses an interesting Greek word. Let me read the verse again. He's speaking with Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, as way New King James translated. The Greek word is exodus. Does that sound familiar, the word exodus? The word exodus used three times in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, Stephen uses it in his sermon to talk about the exodus. You know, Israel coming out of Egypt, the exodus. God brought his people out, their departure out of the land of Egypt, the exodus. It's used in another place. It's used in the passage that we're reading in 2 Peter. I want you to notice this. Peter had been on the mountain. He talks about it right here in verse 16. We didn't follow these cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. But go up a few verses earlier. Go up to verse 12 in explaining why he's writing what he's writing. He said, this, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know 
and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right. As long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. The word translated decease is the word exodus. Then he starts talking about when he heard Peter, I mean Jesus and Moses and Elijah talking about Jesus's exodus. You see what's happened to Peter? Peter's changed his whole way of thinking. When he made the great confession and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're not one among many, you're the one. And Jesus said, but you don't understand my kingdom. And he started to explain how he was going to die. And Peter said, no, you're not going to die. Peter's shrinking back from death, not wanting to. That's not part of what you're going to do. Lord. Death doesn't have a role. And Jesus said, absolutely, it has a role. I'm going to die. But it's an exodus. It's an exodus. And he takes them later, six days later, up onto a mountain with James and John. And they're standing there with Moses and Elijah, and they see it, and they're talking about Jesus' exodus. He's going to the cross. He's going to fulfill everything that Moses said, all the prophets, the law and the prophets, all be fulfilled in Jesus' death and resurrection. And then later in the Garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done. And Jesus drinking that cup and being baptized with that baptism and laying down his life and rising from the dead. And now Peter, writing to the believers, says, listen, as long as I'm in this body, I'm going to remind you of these things. Because I know Jesus has made it clear to me that I'm going to die. That's what he said. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Jesus told them, when you get old, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. Peter, according to church tradition or church history, he was crucified. And when they came to crucify him, he was with his wife. They crucified husband and wife at the same time. He died while his wife's being crucified. Unimaginable. And according to the church tradition, they came to crucify him. And Peter said, listen, I'm not worthy to be dying in the same manner as my Lord. And so according to the tradition, they crucified him hanging upside down. They said, okay, you don't want to die like Jesus? Then we'll flip you upside down. Peter died. I must put off my tent as the Lord showed me, but I want you to remember these things after what? After my exodus. See, Peter's embraced now the nature of the kingdom of Jesus. Yes, I'm going to die. But I saw him. I saw him on the mountain. I heard the voice of God accepting his life. And I watched him lay down that perfect and glorious and amazing life in the cross. And I watched him rise from the dead. I saw him alive after the dead. And, and now I know that he is who he said he is. And now I understand the nature of his kingdom. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. And he did die for us. And he had to die. And if he didn't die, we'd all be dead. But he laid down that perfect life so that he could take it up again, so that he could be the captain of our salvation, the author and the finisher of our faith, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus, our Savior. So now Peter's been transformed. And now what Jesus spoke about with Moses and Elijah, Peter takes that same word and uses it to apply to himself. That's when you know you've embraced something, when you take something that's Jesus's and now you realize it's yours. My own exodus. Jesus speaking on the mountain of his exodus. Now Peter writing later at his own death and he uses the same words. But in our story, that's the good part about Peter. In our story, to finish, coming to the end now, the place of the transfiguration in the life of the disciples or the apostles, Peter had a suggestion. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses and Elijah. Why would he say such a thing? Well, Peter stands for us for all time as a warning continually and in many occasions, but it's almost always the same blunder. Peter is, 
is constantly losing sight of the spiritual things. And losing sight of the spiritual things, he says the stupidest things. Can you imagine the look on Moses and Elijah's face when Peter suggests making tabernacles for them? Is Peter going to run down to REI and get a tent? What's Peter going to, when Peter says tabernacle, what's the picture in Peter's mind of tabernacle? They're out on a mountain. Peter's not a builder. He, did, he can't go to Home Depot and get some two by fours and some sheetrock. What's he thinking of building? Well, we need to stay up here. That's good for us to be here. We'll make, we could, maybe we could use the word lean to. I could get some sticks and some brush and we could make little shelters for the glorified Moses who spent the last 1,500 years in the presence of God. And Elijah, who went up in a chariot of fire, I'm sure he'd love to sit down in the brush underneath the lean-to that I, the fisherman from Capernaum, would build for him. Do you understand how foolish it is? What would a man, a glorified heavenly man, want anything to do with a tabernacle on earth? Now listen, Peter, in, in 2 Peter, do you notice he used the word tent? I must put off my tent. I must put off my tabernacle. But in our story, what's he suggesting? Men who've put off their tabernacle, well, let me make an earthly tabernacle. Like, why would, Peter, do you understand that we're talking about the victory of Jesus that sets us free from earthly tabernacles? Why would you suggest that we would make tabernacles? But a man who loses sight of spiritual things and becomes preoccupied with material things will always end up making a fool of himself. It's a lesson from Peter for us. We lose the sense of the spiritual. We lose our communion with Jesus. And we will say some pretty stupid things and make some pretty stupid mistakes. And in the context in our passage, this all happened six days later. Six days after what? Peter said, you're not one among many. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. So why in the world would he make a tent for Moses if Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Why in the world would they make a tabernacle? Why would you make three tabernacles? Peter, you just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Why would you make three tabernacles? And God interrupts him and a cloud descends. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he says, listen to him. And they're freaked out and they're on their faces and they're praying for the cloud to go away. <laughs> they're, ah. And... The cloud departs, and they're on their faces, and Jesus comes over and says, you guys can get up. It's okay. Get up, guys. Don't be afraid. And they, they get up, and what does it say? They look around, and they only see Jesus. What did God say? We'll have none of this three tabernacles business. I revealed to you that my son is the Christ, the son of the living God. Why would you build a tabernacle for Moses? You're going to add something to Jesus? Why would you build a tabernacle for Elijah, why would you put these three guys together and put them in tabernacles? Why would you build a lean-to for all three of them? Didn't you say Jesus is the one? If, if you want to have everything that Moses was about, then you have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, he's the fulfillment of the law. If you have everything that the prophets wrote about, you want it, it's in Jesus Christ. If you have him, you have it all. God's saying, this is my son, listen to him. And Peter had forgotten his great confession. And so God it graciously reminds him. And so we look at this story. It's a very interesting story. We could spend weeks and weeks, I think, just going back over it and mining more application and, and uh, just an uh, amazing, amazing story. The transfiguration, the role in the ministry of Jesus, the role in the disciples. But what about you? What about you? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you confess that he's the Christ, the son of the living God? Do you understand the nature of his kingdom? Are you like Peter saying, I know that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, but I really don't like your kingdom. <laughs> you know, Peter came around. He, he grasped it. He got it. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you. And that as you follow Jesus, he would be revealing himself to you. I don't know that this story encourages us to seek these kind of visions or things because with, it, with this kind of a vision comes a great sense of responsibility. These guys became very aware of Jesus and his relationship with death. And so what, was, what happened in their life? 
they died. But they spoke of it as their exodus. Well, how did they know that? Because they'd seen him raise the little girl from the dead, and they'd seen him in all of his glory, and they'd seen him in Gethsemane embrace it. And they saw him after his resurrection. And so now as they go through their lives, they say, you know, we know who he is, and we know what he's about. And we don't, you know, we're not blindly courageous like we used to be. Neither are we shrinking back, but we're following Jesus. We're walking with him. I pray that the Lord would help you to follow Jesus. We live in a world that's so messed up. People thinking that materialism is life. Gaining is life. But Jesus is life. He's the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Lord, we thank you for how you speak to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, for the mysteries. And that even as we consider something like this, it's still at the end we'd say as mysterious as it was when we started. I don't know, Lord, that I know any more about your glory than I, I did last week, but I do want to know more, Lord. I, maybe I know more, but as I look forward, I still feel like I haven't even started to understand you, your majesty, your glory, your holiness. And Lord, in the story, I relate all too well with the apostles, sleeping when they should be praying, confused, Peter speaking when he really should just be quiet, losing sight of the spiritual and losing his communion with Jesus and then making foolish decisions. Lord, we pray and we ask you to, to as you were patient with them, that you'd be patient with us. And Lord, I pray and I ask you to speak to every person listening about who you really are and that we would follow you. Lord, you're, you're worth following even into death. And Lord, as, as you spoke of your exodus, and then Peter ultimately spoke of his exodus, may, Lord, you help us to live in light of eternity, that we would be able to speak of our own death as an exodus, not something that we would blindly run into or something that we would shrink back from, that, but that we would just walk in loyalty and faithfulness, and we just walk with Jesus. So, Lord, pour out your spirit on us and help us to follow you, we pray in your name. Amen.